I moved to Toronto about 22 years ago. Uh, you can tell from my accent from New York. And uh, I was originally here working as the chaplain at the University of Toronto. And I was spending my spare time helping the Julius with Jews for Judaism. And uh, I spent quite a few years downtown at the university. And during one of those early years, I received a phone call from someone not far from here, actually, that was in a tremendous amount of distress and uh, told me that their place of living was haunted by evil spirits and that these evil spirits were causing a tremendous amount of problems. And uh, this person seemed extremely upset and agitated by what she was describing and asked me to help and said, you have to come to my place and you have to basically cast out these demons, these evil spirits. And uh, I have a little bit of background in psychology. I majored in psychology. I have been doing counseling for many, many years. <coughs> my suspicion was that uh, this place was not really inhabited by evil demons. My, my intuition told me that this person needed some help. That was my, my instincts. This person needed to speak to someone that could be helpful, some kind of a counselor or a therapist. And I tried very desperately to make a referral. I tried for over an hour to convince this person that they don't need to speak with me, that I probably can't be much help, and that the problem is probably not with the house. The problem is really probably more internal. And I was getting nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And it was extremely frustrating because the person was reaching out for help, very desperate, and I believed in the wrong direction and I was trying to offer what I thought was the most appropriate kind of advice and literally I was hitting a brick wall. And after another half hour or so of back and forth, uh, this person pulled out what turned out to be a trump card and told me that if you don't come and help me, Rabbi Skoback, I'm going to the Catholic priest across the street. <laughs> and I said, you win. Okay, so I drove up from downtown and I stopped off at my house. I think back then I was still living in an apartment and uh, I told my wife, I have to go to basically do a ghost busting. <laughs> and uh, my wife is much wiser than me in these issues. And she said, no, you're not. He said, uh, I don't want you to go unless you take along with you two other rabbis. And I said to myself, how in the world am I going to find two other rabbis to go with me on short notice? Thank God I have quite a few good friends in the city. And I thought of two candidates off the top of my head. They were gone unnamed at this point. But I called them and they were willing to come with me. So we got together and we had to have a quick powwow. What are we going to do? Because I will tell you that uh, we didn't go to the same rabbinical schools, but none of us were there on the day when this topic was covered in <laughs> rabbinical school. Uh, so we basically had to ad lib. We had to ad lib. And I think that. Uh, Given the circumstances, I think we did a pretty, we, we came up with a pretty reasonable plan. We stopped off at one of the Jewish bookstores on the way to her place. We purchased a mezuzah. We also picked up a pushka, a stucca box for charity. We took along a prayer book. And what we basically did was to have in this house essentially a form of Hanukkah Tabayit, a dedication of the house, where we 
came into a house that had no mezuzot, no mezuzahs on the doors. So we explained the importance of a mezuzah in a Jewish home. We put a very beautiful mezuzah on the front door. We explained the importance of having charity box, a pushka, uh, a, a place to give charity, to give in our lives, how important it is. I'll be speaking about some of this next week. We gave her that. Uh, we recited Psalm 30, which is the psalm for the dedication of the sanctuary, the temple, but also each one of our homes is supposed to be a temple. We said a few other psalms, and we basically spoke about uh, what it means to have peace in our homes, how you can have peace in the home, and incredibly, I I'm thrilled to tell you, it worked that I would run into this person occasionally, and thank God, uh, things seem to be fine. Things, things seem to be okay. About 10 years later, I run into the person again, and basically the message is, they're back. <laughs> and uh, now I went right to my wife. And uh, we spoke about it. And she had what I thought was a very uh, insightful idea. Uh, she thought it would be important to give this person specifically some sense of empowerment. And so we came up with a two-part plan. The first thing we did was to ask permission if we could take her to a mikvah. The tradition is normally uh, People that are not married don't go to a mikvah, a Jewish ritual bath for purification, but we were told we could do this. And so we took her to a mikvah just to give her a sense of spiritual cleansing. And then my wife felt that the more important piece would be to teach her about the Jewish tradition of netilat yadayim in the morning, of washing your hands in the morning. That there's an idea that when we go to sleep at night, where the Talmud says one sixtieth of death. It's a form of death because we're not really fully alive. We're sort of in a sleep state, which is a quasi uh, state of death. I'll be speaking about this during our dream session. And the Jewish law says that when we wake up in the morning, there's a sort of a residue of spiritual impurity that basically adheres to our hands. So there's a tradition we have of washing our hands with water three times over each hand uh, as a way of, again, purifying ourselves in the morning and also in the same way that the high priest and the priest would wash their hands before the temple service. It's a way of dedicating ourselves to our daily service of God. And my wife felt that this simple but easy and uh, accessible Jewish practice would give this person a sense of empowerment that I'm taking control over my life spiritually. And thank God that seemed to have done the trick. I haven't heard any further complaints. Now, I don't know if this was spoken about by this person, but a, a number of months later, I received another phone call from someone in Richmond Hill. Shortly before Rosh Hashanah, a day or two before Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Skoback, you have to come to my house we have a horrible problem with evil spirits here, and uh, I think I might have looked up to God and said, why me? But um, I said, okay. And uh, I said, I, I think I have a sense of what I want to do. Again, you have to appreciate that this is purely ad-libbing, and uh, I took a chauffeur with me. And I came into the house, a beautiful big house, and uh, we spoke for a few minutes, uh, and I took out the chauffeur and I blew it as loudly and as hard as I could. And uh, I said, I hope that does the trick. And I haven't heard back from this person since then, so I hope that that worked. <laughs> now, I wanna share with you one more story because these stories will be bracketing, I think, uh, some of the complexity of the Jewish approach to some of these issues we'll be discussing tonight. A number of years ago, I was giving a series of lectures in the United States, in Ohio, and after I finished my, my lectures, 
uh, someone drove me back to the airport, so returned to Toronto. And uh, on the way to the airport, this person was very spiritual and was giving me uh, many blessings. Maybe five minutes worth of very beautiful blessings. It was very nice to hear these blessings. And then the blessing stopped short. And the fellow says to me, you know, Rabbi Skoback, I think you should get your mezuzahs checked. Now, I was taken aback by this because you are supposed to check your mezuzahs regularly. And we had not checked our mezuzahs in a long time. We actually went over the time that uh, they should have been checked. And it so happened that we had arranged for the very next day for someone to come to our home, take all the mezuzot down in the morning, check them and bring them back at night. Someone here, at least one person in town does that. And so here, after years of not checking them, and the very next day I'm about to have them checked, this fellow out of the blue says, I think you should have your mezuzahs checked. And I was sort of struck by this. And then he says to me very casually, I think you have a problem with the front door. Noted. And then he says, on the second floor of your house, and then I really shut up because how does he know I have a house? How does he know it has a second floor? He says, on the second floor of your house, there is a bathroom. Okay, that's not uh, such a hard thing to guess. Uh, he says, but across from the bathroom, there are two rooms. He got that one right. He says, you've got a problem with those two rooms as well. I'm just taking it all in. I'm playing my cards close to my vest. I'm not really giving much feedback, but I'm getting freaked out. <laughs> And of course, the next day, when the mezuzah man comes and I hand them over, I am very anxious the whole day to find out what's going to be when he comes back at night. The mezuzahs come back at night, and as we say in Aramaic, the kach hava, and so it was. The front door and those two rooms had problems with the mezuzot. Now, I was very shaken up by this. I immediately called uh, the people back in the United States who had brought me out, and I said, does this fellow do this? And they said, yes, he does this quite routinely. <clears throat> Something was going on here. Now, I'll tell you that I have a bit of a personal history when it comes to uh, what might seem to be strange things in the Jewish world or superstition, maybe going back to an early age. Uh, I didn't grow up in a very observant Jewish home, but we went to synagogue occasionally. And one of the things that I heard as a child, that obviously for children, this is very, very spooky, was that on the holidays when the priests of the synagogue go to the front of the synagogue and say the Birhat Kalanim, the priestly benediction, so <coughs> We were told that you shouldn't look at the priests because if you do, you'll go blind. Now, my friends and I found this amusing and spooky. And so what we would do every holiday was we would talk among ourselves. We'd sit behind a family and we talk among ourselves and we say, I think we're going to try and look. And then one of us, after talking about the fact that we're going to look, would just start screaming that we can't see and we're blind. <laughs> the truth is that in the times of the temple, when the Shekhinah, when the Holy Presence, God's Holy Presence was present in the temple, so we're told that God's Divine Presence did rest on the fingers of the Kohanim. But after the destruction of the first temple, we know that the Shekhinah departed. We don't really have this issue in a spiritual way nowadays. And the Mishnah Brewer, the Chafetz Chaim, explains that the reason that we're not supposed to look at the priests, at the Kohanim, is so that we'll be able to concentrate on their blessings. The whole purpose of not looking at them is so they'll be able to focus our attention on the blessings that they're transmitting to us from God. But people go so overboard with this idea of not looking at the priests, 
that what many people do is actually turn their backs and face away from the priests. <laughs> many people actually recite the paragraphs in the Siddur while the actual blessing is being relayed by the Kohanim. So we're turning our backs on the blessing, and while the blessings are being given, we interrupt the blessings with our own recitation of these paragraphs, and so we unwittingly sabotage the entire experience. There's a tremendous amount of superstition that floats around the Jewish world. The truth is that when it comes to these matters, and I don't want to make light of them, I believe that the old Zen statement holds true. The Zen masters would say, he who says doesn't know, and he who knows doesn't say. I can tell you that I know a little bit about this topic tonight, and so I'll feel comfortable sharing a little tiny bit, but then we'll have to call it even. All of you know that in recent times, there's been an explosion of interest in matters of the occult, and this is greatly reflected in popular culture. I'm just going to share with you a very short digest of what all of us have been seeing over the past number of decades. We all, or many of us in the room, grew up with movies like Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, Damien's, Ghostbusters 1, Ghostbusters 2. I'm not sure how many there were ultimately. I think there was Ghostbusters 3. The Blair Witch Project, uh, and today numerous other films, including the current obsession with zombies. Uh, music, as you all know, has been extremely influenced by uh, Satanism, the occult, witchcraft, uh, heavy metal music especially, very much uh, impacted uh, by these issues. Uh, performers such as Ozzy Osbourne, Black Sabbath, kids flashing the devil sign at concerts. There's a whole pervasiveness of occultism and uh, the devil in much of heavy metal, heavy metal and other forms of rock music. Um, books and magazines, this has been widespread. Harry Potter, obviously, at the top of the heap. Uh, these are books that swept the world. And there are over 3,000, not books, over 3,000 publishing companies uh, that deal with books on the occult. And they sell over a billion dollars a year, well over a billion dollars of books and magazines sold each year dealing with these issues. A number of years ago, I did a bit of an experiment. I went down to the world's largest bookstore. I'm not sure if it really is the world's largest bookstore, but it's called the world's largest bookstore. I think it's on Edward Street. And uh, I, I did a survey of all of the sections in that store dealing with the occult. And I found to my surprise that the number of books uh, dealing with the occult at the world's largest bookstore far exceeded all the books on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam combined. They had entire sections. This is a number of years ago. It might have gotten better. But a number of sections dealing with crystals, shamanism, channeling, divination, tarot, I Ching, astrology, black magic, new age, witchcraft, angels, Gnosticism, and numerous other topics, entire sections of the store dealing with all of these issues. We know, this is back when I was growing up and it still takes place today, The games are heavily into issues of the occult from Ouija boards to Dungeons and Dragons where spells are cast and witchcraft is used in fantasy role-playing games. Today on the internet, these games are extremely popular uh, and very, very lifelike in many cases. Uh, learning institutions, adult learning institutions, such as the Learning Annex, which is all over North America, offer dozens of courses on occult topics, such as how to experience your past and future lives, out-of-body experiences, astral projection, how to read auras, and channeling, and numerous other topics are regularly taught 
in adult education courses throughout North America. Every newspaper, as long as newspapers are still around, I'm not sure how long that's going to last, but every newspaper and many magazines have horoscopes that are consulted by millions of people. There are dozens of 1-800 or 1-900 uh, ads and lines, infomercials on television promoting various types of psychic advice. Uh, and numerous mediums such as Sylvia Brown, John Edward, James Von Prague, uh, and numerous other people regularly appear on television and elsewhere helping people to contact their dearly departed. About 30% of police uh, forces allegedly use psychic detectives today in the world. And, as you all know, we even have kosher fortune cookies. <laughs> What's going on? We live in a world where there's been increasing secularization of our society, which has left a tremendous spiritual vacuum. And with the tremendous rush in our world to pursue material success, we know that people ultimately find that to be very empty, and people discover that the emperor has no clothes. That's not the source of salvation, to have more things, to possess more things. And so many people go beyond the material world to try to seek ultimate answers to the big questions in life. This is already prophesied in the Jewish Bible in the book of Amos. Amos chapter 8, verse 11, God says, Behold, I'm going to send a famine to the land, but not a hunger for bread or a thirst for water, but a thirst for spirituality, a, fir a thirst to hear the words of God. We're going to be living in a time, the Bible says, where there's going to be a tremendous thirst for things spiritual. We all know the world is a very scary place to live in these days. We live in very uncertain times. Life is extremely precarious. People in the prime of their lives succumb to very scary and deadly diseases. Our environment is often in peril. The economy is unstable. And global terrorism is growing. Just a week after the bombings in Boston, they arrested today two people in Canada in a plot to blow up a train to going from Canada to the United States. They expect at least three more arrests in this case. But we always seem to be waiting for the next shoe to drop. Occult and superstitious practices are a way of gaining some degree of control over our lives. And that, I believe, is the major attraction. We have segulas, we have somehow, I'm not sure if there's a good English translation for segula, a lucky charm or a fortuitous practice, but we have in the Jewish world segulas for people who want to get married. Uh, many people will run after the wedding ceremony takes place and pick up the pieces of glass that are left over from a broken glass. Any kind of thing that we can take hold of that might give us a little bit of control over a life that seems to be so out of control, people grasp for. Today, people spend $25 sometimes to buy a little red string to put around their wrists to ward off the evil eye. I heard an amazing story. By the way, you don't need to spend $25. You'll probably get it for much cheaper. I imagine a few cents is what all it should cost. Uh, one of the most popular rabbis in New York today is Rabbi Reisman. He gives a, a lecture that attracts, I was told, a thousand people in New York, but his lectures are telecast all over the world. They're shown here in Toronto as well. And he told an amazing story. One of his congregants uh, was a descendant of the Noam Elimelech, one of the great, great Hasidic masters. And the Noam Elimelech, Rabbi Elimelech Lezhensk, wrote a book that is called the Noam Elimelech. And this family had an original version, a very, very original version of the book. And to them, it was a prized possession. And the family would take it whenever a special occasion 
was going on. So if there was a wedding, they would bring this book to the wedding. If there was a bris, they would take it to the bris. And in the family was a member of his congregation that was a attorney that worked on very, very big cases. And he was involved in a case that was going on for over three years. And there was a tremendous amount of money that could have been his if he won the case. I think he was looking at three or four million dollars as a payoff if he won this case. So on the day when the case was going to be decided, this attorney went to his father and said, Tati, I need the Noam Elimelech. And he puts it in his attache case and he brings it to the courtroom. I think this was on a Friday morning. Friday night, the fellow shows up in the synagogue. Rabbi Reisman can see from the look on his face it didn't turn out well. He went over to the attorney just to talk about, you know, how things were going. And the attorney said, you know, when I went to my father after I lost the case, I complained to my father. I said, Ta, it's not working. It doesn't work. So his father said, you don't think it works? Did you ever read the Noam el Melech? Did you ever read the book? He said, at the very back of the book, at the back of the Noam el Melech, he gives a blessing. The author gives a blessing to all of his descendants. And one of the blessings was that none of them would ever become wealthy. <laughs> he says, the book is working. The book is working. What's unfortunate, what's terribly unfortunate, is that the very same media today, the very same media that promotes a fascination with the occult and the bizarre, tends to disparage traditional religion and caricaturizes traditional religion as trite, as out of touch, as irrelevant. And the role models in popular culture that are so impactful on everyone in the world today rarely embrace traditional values, but serve as a pulpit for the occult and for the new age. And they gear to a society that is so fixed on seeking quick and simple solutions to very complex issues in life. The truth is that virtually all new age practices have been anticipated in the Bible and there is some truth to the claim that the new age is really nothing more than recycled old paganism. Now how do we understand these occult practices such as witchcraft, sorcery, astrology? There's a whole list of powers in the occult. How do we understand them as Jews? Basically, there is a famous and long-standing dispute between Maimonides, the Rambam, and virtually everyone else in the Jewish world of Jewish philosophy. The Rambam's position was that all of these occult practices should not be used or engaged in because the Rambam says they are basically baloney. He says they're idiotic, they're fake, they're deception, and he says essentially that the Torah commands us not to be fools, not to be idiots. And he says to get involved with these kind of occult practices is basically putting ourselves into a world of lunacy, of idiocy, what he would consider an entire, complete waste of time. That's the position of Maimonides. However, as I just mentioned, he is unique in this approach. Virtually everyone else follows along the lines of Nachmanides, the Ranban, who says that actually the Bible takes these practices quite seriously. As a matter of fact, when the Bible speaks about idolatry, the Bible refers to idolatry as Elohim Acherim, other gods. It wouldn't use the word Elohim, God, for something that was idiotic and stupid and had no power whatsoever. And so Nachmanides takes the view that all of these practices actually are potent, they can work, but the Bible tells us to not go there, to stay away. 
Basically, what our sages teach us is that the world was created with both positive and negative spiritual forces. The truth is that the world of nature itself, we try to understand how God runs the world. God runs the world to a great extent through nature. We live in a world where there are natural forces. What happens often in the occult is an attempt to manipulate, to take control, to outwit, to predict, to co-opt the natural forces in the world. And there are two levels of these natural forces. There are the laws of nature in which we operate on a physical level, but then there are the spiritual forces that basically mediate between the Almighty and our physical world. What the Kabbalists speak about are a level of worlds. The example that's most easily given is that it would be very difficult for the physical world we're living in to connect directly to the upper spiritual worlds. It would be like taking your vacuum cleaner and plugging it into a nuclear generator. It's not going to work. So what happens is we have these step-down generators that allow the ultimate power of the nuclear generator to become more accessible down where we live. In the same way, what the Mekubalim, the Kabbalists, teach us is that from the upper supernal spiritual worlds, there are different spiritual levels where all these spiritual forces finally are able to come down into our world. The spiritual world right above us is, for example, the world where astrological powers are mediated. So what happens, for example, when the person taps into the powers of astrology, they're not really reading into the future. They're not predicting the future. They're able to see the present, meaning they're able to see on that level of the spiritual world what's going on now. And they're able to see how that is going to play out when it comes down into our physical world. Nachmanides tells us, and many of the Kabbalists teach us, that what the occult powers do is to try to take control of the natural forces of the world, to try to manipulate the spiritual forces of the world, and there's one more layer. The Bible teaches us that there has to be a balance of power in the spiritual world. Because if there was only one kind of spiritual force in the world, it would have a negative impact on our freedom of choice. So for example, if there are positive spiritual forces in the world, for example, we had in the times of the Bible, the power of prophecy. We had in the temple, the Urim Vitumim, these amazing powers to be able to know things spiritually. We had miracles in the time of the Bible. So when you have all of these positive spiritual forces, and you only had those spiritual forces, that would basically make it very difficult for a person to go anywhere else other than in that direction. So what our sages teach us is that the world was created with a spiritual economy. If there are spiritual forces that are positive, there has to be a balance of negative spiritual forces. And so therefore, there are the forces what we would call the dark side. What the capitalists refer to as the citra akara, the other side. What sorcery does is to try to manipulate these forces. The Bible says, even though these forces are real, don't go there. That's the position of Judaism. We're not supposed to use these forces. And there have basically been three understandings of how these forces are able to impact us. One approach, again, which seems to be the approach of Maimonides, is that these forces don't have any real power, but they can have psychosomatic effects on you if you are scared by them. Meaning, if you somehow let yourself open to these forces, and you let yourself believe that there's some power there, Maimonides would say there is no power, you subject yourself to possible psychosomatic repercussions. Nachmanides, again, and most people say there is real power, but it can't affect you. The Bible promises us that we don't have to be affected by these spiritual forces. Abraham, for example, was told, 
that according to the astrological signs in the world, he would never have children. According to the flow of natural astrology, Abraham was told he would have no children. The Bible says God took him beyond the stars. And the message of the Bible is that we don't have to be, we don't have to sense that we're being controlled by forces beyond our control. The Bible says that if we don't really give ourselves over to these forces, they can't really affect us. And that ultimately we can override all of these forces through our prayers, through our good deeds. It's a very famous story in the Talmud where the astrologers said that Rabbi Akiva's daughter was going to die on a certain date. They were able to tell by astrological, astrological predictions Rabbi Akiva's daughter was going to die on a certain date. It was the day of her wedding. So happened that right before the wedding, a poor person came to the door. She helped this poor person, gave the person something. And then she was adjusting her cap. Apparently it was held on by some kind of a pin. While she was adjusting her cap, she took out the pin. She put it into the wall in order to keep it for a few moments. Took it out, put it back into her hair. Got married. Later that day they saw on the other side of the wall this pin had gone through a scorpion. So it could be that maybe if she didn't do this act of kindness, maybe this thing would have happened to her. But we're never under the control of these forces. But the ultimate message of the Bible is that if we don't pay too much attention to these forces, they can't really affect us negatively. And finally, another point of view which says that there may or may not be power in these forces, but the effects of these forces can be punishments if we believe in them and take them seriously. I want to emphasize that even though most sources do not accept the approach of Maimonides and do insist that there are real occult spiritual forces in the world, it's important to emphasize that today very few of these people really exist. Virtually all occult practitioners today are fakers. Meaning that there was once true astrology, but the astrological horoscopes in any newspaper today are not true astrology. They don't have any real power. And there have been, by the way, many scientific experiments to prove this. One of the best ones is where they took dozens and dozens of people and gave them all the same exact astrological prediction that was based upon a chillant of different astrological charts all put together. Every single person read them and said, wow, that is so accurate, that is me. The truth is that if any of the people today making psychic predictions really had power to know the future, they wouldn't be charging you $25 to take a reading They'd be going to the horse track or playing the stock market and making millions of dollars. If any of the people today claiming to be healers really had the power to heal, they would go into a hospital and clean it out. Groucho Marx once went to a famous psychic who was telling people about their dead relatives. Everyone was gushing. Marx asked the person, can I ask a question? The psychic said, sure, you can ask me any question. Marx said, any question? The psychic said, sure, you can ask me any question. Groucho Marx said, what's the capital of North Dakota? <laughs> it's Bismarck, in case you want to know. But basically, the people today that are practicing the occult are generally speaking charlatans. The Bible tells us in the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy that there will be false prophets in the world that will be able to do incredible miracles, but that God is giving these people the ability to do miracles in order to test us. So if there is the ability for these people to do incredible things with their powers, it's basically there in order to test us, to see if we will keep our focus on God and not on these people and their magic tricks. The great Gaon of Vilna was once giving a Torah lecture. And in the middle of his lecture, a huge clap of thunder was heard 
by all the students, a frighteningly loud clap, just like we heard last week, I think, in the middle of our lecture. And the students stopped after hearing this thunderclap, and they said the blessing that you're supposed to say when you hear thunder. They looked at a very disappointed face from the Vilna Gon. Their teacher looked very unhappy. And they said, Rebbe, did we say the wrong blessing? And he said, no, you didn't say the wrong blessing. But if you had really been paying attention to the lecture, you wouldn't have noticed the thunder. <laughs> so the question is, often these incredible powers, if they do exist, are there basically to test us and to see if we'll be distracted by them. I told another story last week that I'm going to retell this week, but it has a different application. And again, if you were here last week, please indulge me. Uh, I mentioned last week that it was told by uh, another Rebbe, but I, I heard it this, in this version by the Chidush Harim, the first Gera Rebbe, who I'm named after. So the story was told of a person who desired to have a very special horse. And he was very wealthy, and he spent a tremendous amount of money to purchase the most expensive horse in all of Europe. And uh, he wanted to take care of this horse and protect it properly. So he built a very, very elaborate and beautiful stable for the horse. He put on a very, very expensive and fancy lock onto the front door of the stable. And then he hired a security guard to watch the stable 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He thinks he's going to go to sleep feeling confident that his horse is safe. He can't sleep. He's nervous. He's afraid. Maybe the, the guard's going to fall asleep. So he gets dressed quickly. He runs downstairs at midnight and he sees, oh, thank God, the guard is still awake. So he asked the fellow, he says, you know, it's very late at night. How do you stay up all night? So the fellow says, you know, what I do is I ponder very, very complicated questions. Like I think of a question that's very difficult to figure out and I try to figure it out and it helps me stay awake. So the fellow says, what are you thinking about? He says, you know, I'm wondering when a person takes a nail and hammers it into the wall, what happens to all the wood that was there where the nail is now? The nail is there, but where is all, where is all the wood? So the owner of the horse looks at him a little strange, but says, okay, if it's keeping you awake, keep thinking. So he goes back to his house, he tries to fall asleep, he's rolling in bed, he's tossing and turning, he can't fall asleep because he's nervous, this guy's gonna definitely fall asleep. So he runs back down to the barn. It's now three o'clock in the morning. He sees the fellow is still awake. He says, wow, you're still awake. What are you thinking about now? He says, now, oh boy. He says, this is really hard. He said, I was wondering when they make bagels, so there's a hole in the middle of the bagel. What happens to all that dough where the hole is now? Where did the dough go? So the owner looks at him again, rolls his eyes and says, okay, keep thinking. He tries to go back to sleep, he can't, he's still very nervous. He's tossing and turning several hours. He runs down, he thinks this guy's surely gonna be asleep. At six o'clock in the morning, he sees, thank God he's still awake. He says, it's amazing, you've been awake all night long. What are you thinking about now? He says, now? Woo! Boy, do I have a big question now. He says, you know, you bought the most expensive horse in the world, and you put it into this incredible barn that you built, and you put on an amazing lock, and then you hired me to guard the horse. So I was wondering, where's the horse? <laughs> so the Chidush Harim said that if you waste so much energy and you spend so much time focusing on useless things, then your Yetzirah, your evil inclination, has a very wide gap to come in and steal your right mind. That's one of the dangers with focusing our minds where they shouldn't be focusing. The Kutzke Rebbe used to say that I avoid evil not so much because it's wrong, he said I avoid it because there's no time. I don't have time to waste on it. You know, people get very caught up with the issue of the evil eye. And people go to extreme lengths to make sure we spit when we see a baby, right? And, you know, we have all kinds of practices to make sure nothing is going to happen with the evil eye. I think there are more and less healthy ways to think about the eye in hara, the evil eye. I think often we get distracted by the assumption 
that we can find some kind of mechanical cure, like again, putting a red string on our hand. Obviously, the evil eye doesn't work like magic. If you talk about your new house, there's not going to be some magical force that sends termites. If someone says your baby is adorable, something magical is not going to happen to the child. Rabbi Dessler, one of the great thinkers of our time, explained that the change from the evil eye will not come to your home or to your baby, but the change will come to the listener or to the observer. Certain statements or behaviors call attention to what you have, and they can make other people jealous. When other people are jealous of what you have, they may begin to pray for something negative to happen to you. Prayer is a real spiritual force. Or, when people are jealous of what you have, they may try to call attention, maybe in the upper worlds, to what you have, and bring more scrutiny upon you than you're able to withstand. Many times we get things in life and maybe it was a gift on some level. And maybe if the eye of true judgment was placed upon us, we wouldn't fully deserve the things that we have. God is often very kind to us. So it could be that the evil eye, so to speak, will bring a scrutiny upon us that we may not be able to handle. Do we really deserve all the things that we have? Or Will the person who we've provoked with jealousy try to subconsciously sabotage us? The Torah tells us that we're supposed to have sensitivity even for the feelings of inanimate things. It's an amazing part of Judaism. We're supposed to develop ourselves to even have sensitivity to the feelings of things that are inanimate. For example, you all know the custom of covering the challah on Friday night when we're saying Kiddush. Because normally, every Jewish meal begins with bread. Friday night, we're skipping over the bread. We're beginning with wine. Maybe the bread's going to get upset. So in order the bread shouldn't get upset, we cover the bread. Obviously, the bread is not neurotic. The problem is us. The problem is, are we going to become insensitive? It's really to affect us, not so much the bread. There's a Jewish custom that when you go into a cemetery, you take your tzitzit and you tuck them in because it's considered to be mocking the dead to flaunt the fact that you can perform mitzvot. This person's no longer alive. They cannot do any mitzvot. Does the person really see your tzitzit? It's not so much for their benefit. It's for your benefit. We don't want to become the kind of person that is insensitive even to the feelings of the inanimate. Judaism tries to instill in us, if we're going to be sensitive even to the feelings of that which is inanimate, obviously the true goal of Judaism is that we should become sensitive to the feelings of other people. Do we cause other people any discomfort or any jealousy by displaying or calling attention to what we have. So the best remedy for this is not running out and buying a red wristband. The best remedy is learning to live more simply and learning to live more modestly. Not necessarily or unnecessarily calling attention to what we have. You know, the world we live in, as I pointed out, is a very scary place. And it's often tempting to try to get some kind of amulet or lucky charm or some kind of a practice to do to gain some control over your finances, over your health, over other situations in life. You know, in the Bible, there was an incredible story where the Jewish people had, in the desert, done something else to upset God. And God sent snakes to bite the Jewish people and to make them sick. This is a story from Numbers chapter 21. The people had spoken ill of God and Moses. So God sent against them 
burning serpents and they bit the people and many people died. So what did God tell Moses? God told Moses to make a snake out of copper and place it on a stick. Whoever was bitten and will look at this snake will live. Moses then made a snake of copper, put it on a stick, and if the person was bitten by a snake, he would look at the copper snake and would live. Now, if anything sounds like an occult practice, that sounds like an occult practice. But here it was given directly by God as a commandment. What happened ultimately? The Talmud tells us in Tractate Psachim 56a that King Chizkiyahu Hezekiah did two things. He hid the Book of Remedies. There was a Book of Remedies for any physical ailment in the world. There was a book that contained the cure for those ailments. We had the cure for everything. And Chizkiyahu hid that book. And he destroyed the copper snake that was used by Moses. Hezekiah destroyed the copper snake that was used by Moses. Why did he do that? So the Talmud asks in Tractate Rosh Hashanah, Tractate Rosh Hashanah 29a, do you think, for example, that the Jews were able to prevail over the Amalekites simply because Moses raised his hands? But the Bible says that when the Amalekites attacked the Jewish people, Moses was up there with his hands in the air. When his hands are up, the Jews prevailed in the battle. When his hands weren't able to stay up, the Jews lost the battle. And there were people that were holding his hands up to make sure he'd be able to keep the hands up. So the Talmud asks, do you think that the Jews were able to win over the Amalekites simply because Moses raised his hands? No. When he raised his hands and thus caused them to raise their eyes to their Father in heaven, then they prevailed. So too, the Talmud says, <coughs> it wasn't the copper snake that cured anyone. The copper snake didn't cure anyone. But when they looked up towards the copper snake, they were ultimately looking up to their Father in heaven, and then they were able to be cured. Why did Chizkiyahu destroy this copper snake? Because it had become an idol. Any time we take our attention off of God and we put it anywhere else, we put it into a soothsayer, we put it into astrologer, we put it into any other force in the world other than God, that's idolatry. And so Chizkiyahu destroyed this copper snake because it had become an idol. People began to ascribe powers to this copper snake all by itself. And so too with the Book of Remedies. People began to think, who was healing them? It was this remedy, it was that remedy. It's one of the reasons why the Talmud says, Tov Shebarofim Legehenim. The best doctors will go to hell. Why? It's interesting that we pray every day, we call it the Shemona Esrei, the 18 benedictions. There's really 19 nowadays, but originally we had 18 blessings. The word tov in Hebrew is a numerical value of 17. So the rabbis say tov shebarofim legehenim. Doctors who feel that they are really the curers, they're the ones that are curing people, they don't say that 18th blessing. They only recite 17 blessings. They think they are the healer. People like this are basically headed to spiritual destruction. And also it's referring to the best of doctors. A doctor that's a lousy doctor that doesn't cure many people may not get this kind of swelled head. But a person who's a good doctor, a great doctor, they could easily come to the view that, look what I did. Sir, you did nothing. You're just a tool of God. And so the Talmud says that the best of doctors are often headed towards Gehenna, spiritual destruction. You know, a couple came once to the Baal Shem Tov. They were married for many, many, many years, did not have children, and they heard the Baal Shem Tov was able to perform wonders, and they said, Rebbe, can you please pray for us that we should have children? And he sat with the couple for a little while, and he said, you know, I'm willing to pray for you. You're going to have to give me, he asked for a tremendous amount of money. They looked at him like he was crazy. He said, we don't have anything like that. He said, I'm not going to pray for you unless you give me that much money. 
So they ran all over the place. They tried to beg. They scrapped. They scraped. They, they asked people, please help us. They couldn't raise what the Baal Shem Tov was asking for. And they spent days and days and days bitterly trying to raise this money. They came back to him and they said, Rebbe, keep your blessing. We don't need it. We're going to pray ourselves. Of course, the Baal Shem Tov said to himself, yes. Because that's ultimately what had to happen. The worst thing would be for them to think that some great rabbi was able to help them. The fact is that they are supposed to relate directly to God himself. The Torah teaches us that we're supposed to keep our eye on the ball. God wants us to use our brains. When we were told not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it seems very strange. Why would God tell us not to eat from a tree which contains knowledge? Why hold that back from us? The tree of knowledge of good and evil? That might be a good thing to have. Why does God say not to eat from that tree? And one of the reasons might be that if you think you can get something as precious as knowledge by simply eating fruit from a tree, then you will become dead. That's why the Torah says if you eat from that tree, you'll be dead. Because that becomes a life of spiritual death. If you think that you can get something that's ultimately valued simply by eating fruit from a tree, you're in very bad shape. The Torah asks us to keep our eye on the ball. One of the most important commandments in the Torah, and it was the focus of a wonderful book written years ago by one of the leading Kabbalists in the land of Israel. In Hebrew, the book was called Tamim Tiya. You should be wholesome. You should have a wholesome and pure relationship with God. It's based upon the verse in the Bible, Deuteronomy 18, 13, which basically says, don't try to outsmart God. Don't try to figure everything out. Don't try to ferret out the future. Don't try to co-opt all the spiritual forces in the world. Just be a person that goes through life simply relating to God following God's commandments, listening to what God says, putting your trust directly in God. Don't try to figure everything out and beat the system. So this book was written, it's in English, it's called Faith and Folly, because it deals with what became a very serious problem, especially in Israel, with all the fake Kabbalists that would go around extorting money or ripping people off with miracle cures or miracle solutions writing amulets, pronouncing special formulas for people to recite, and the book is urging people not to go there. Rather than putting all your faith in a Kabbalist, put your faith directly in God. The reality is that God is in control of the world, and to prosper, we need to follow God's instructions and not the lure of magical powers.